So, Niels, you've made the decision to retire at the end of this NBL season. Uh, can you give us an idea of uh, why you're choosing to do that and how you came to that decision? Uh, probably a combination of things. Um, before the season, I had, had a decent idea. This would probably be my last year. Um, my role within the team I discussed with Dean throughout the year was going to be pretty minimal. I basically signed to be a part of the team and help you know, with some of the younger players we got coming through, like Krebs, Travers... KB and a few other train on guys, kind of been a bit of a mentor for those kind of similar position guys. So it probably meant my, my actual playing time was going to go down, but the stuff I was doing behind the scenes was going to be more important. And I felt, you know, probably last year was my last real active year of playing, I guess. We had a bit of a tough year. I was filling a few holes. Now we've got the talent that I'm not necessarily required as much on, on court. So, you know, swallowing that uh, pill was probably the hardest that I wasn't going to play. Um, but I guess that made the decision uh, in the last few weeks where I really decided I'm, I'm going to retire now was, was, was pretty easy, really. Can you give us an idea of how difficult it is to swallow that pill and come to that realisation that my playing days are over and I need to start making this transition? Yeah, it's definitely not easy. Uh, the competitor that I am, and you guys know anyone who's played with me, I'm pretty fierce uh, on, on, and off, on, the, on the training track and in the game. And I guess it's, it's been a challenge to kind of check that uh, on, on the sidelines a little bit, even at training, like I, I got to pull it back a little bit, knowing that uh, my biggest skill for the team right now is my relationships, ability with my teammates, not necessarily uh, the physical side of things. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, you know, you look around at other guys around the league, the things they go through, and you kind of take little bits from them. And I, having Rob Lowe in, at the, in the club at the start of the season was quite helpful for me. And he'd been through a couple of years where he didn't really play. And I kind of Learn a few things off him, and he was pretty instrumental in, in getting me to a level where I was I was comfortable with where I sat in the team. Uh, I want to sort of track back over your entire career. Uh, drafted by the Rockets, that came after a really impressive NBL, a few NBL seasons. I want to ask about the different players that you've shared the floor with, either with or against. Who who are some of the names that? When you sit back in a few years and you're speaking to your kids about, hey, I shared the floor with this guy and, and those, those sort of core memories of guys you shared the floor with. Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate enough to play in two Olympics and three World Cups and whenever you play in those events, there's, there's going to be big time, big name players in, in those events. Um, you know, probably the one that stands out would be Kobe Bryant, matching up on him, holding him to 24 points was my, <laughs> my personal highlight. Um, guys like LeBron, Dwayne Wade, Kevin Durant, like the... Basically, the who's who of the last 20 years of, of NBA talent. And you had some really good European players, too, that I was lucky enough to, to play against it domestically, like Navarro, uh, Papa Lucas, uh, Spinoulis, uh, to, to name a few. So, yeah, very, very lucky that I've been able to come across some of these guys and match up on them directly and, you know, do, do my best. Who's the most special player that you played against? Like, the, the guy who you thought, this guy is unbelievably good at this sport. Yeah, the one that I've just left out there, and I'm glad you segued into that. I've, I've mentioned him a lot of times was Ginobili. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, as a, when I was at AIS, he was one of the guys I used to love watching play, the way he slashed the basket, and one of the guys I, 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 I'd like to play like that, you know, and not quite to his level, but um, coming up against him in, uh, let me play him in Beijing, he was the one that, because he could play the FIBA game so well, he knew the, uh, the NBA game, and he was just... He was left-handed. There's just so many th strings to his bow. You thought you had him stopped one way, then he'd spin or take an extra step that he used to do. But he was probably one of my hardest matchups. And no, no Shioni, remember No Shioni as well? Andreas No Shioni. Yeah. He, uh, I played. I matched up with him a fair few times in the Spanish league, and they were, they were good battles. He was kind of coming towards the end of his career, and uh, it was fun to play against him as well. So you say you never got to Ginob Ginobili's level, but I don't know if enough people are aware of how good you were so early. So your first NBL season with the Crocs, uh, you averaged 16, 3, and 2 as a 19-year-old. Now, we talk now, if a 19-year-old is averaging that in today's NBL, that's a lottery pick. Did you have an idea back then that, uh, of the extent of how well you were playing and that it could lead to the career that you've had? Um, it's a funny question because, like, back in those days, the NBA, you didn't really think about it that much. Like, the only one kind of going was Bogues. And he was the best player in the world at under 19. We're like, well, that makes sense. See, I was on that side as well, but I wasn't like the level that of Nouse that he had. Yeah. And um, I guess my my whole dream of playing basketball was to play for Australia. 
I wasn't thinking about the NBA. The coverage isn't what it was today. And the kids now are just so lucky that the amount of uh, coverage it gets, they can watch it you know, after school so easily. The access is incredible. We might have got one or two games a week. Uh, I, I guess I knew I was doing pretty well. I was in a bit of a small town, so there was a bit of small town syndrome up in towns. We were like, you're getting pats on the back, you're in the towns with Bulletin every day. So you did get a bit of that start, stardom, but as far as like what it could have done for me internationally at an early age, I'll never really know. And yeah, like I said, I'm just, the kids now are so lucky and they're pretty, they can be pretty appreciative of what they got. So you ultimately did get drafted uh, and then you started a career in Europe. Uh, I consider you one of the sort of OG Australians in Europe. You and Dave Anderson are the two that come to mind. Uh, what went into the decision to go there and then why did you stick there? Um, I guess I was kind of led to that decision by, by Houston. They kind of felt, and no discredit to the NBL, the players of that time, they felt like I needed to go play in a, in a, in a stronger league, I guess. Yeah. And they deemed European leagues were better than the NBL at that time. Um, my agent personally was like, you can go and make some, some good money over there and set, set your life up pretty well. At the same time, I was staying on the NBA radar. Uh, so I made a decision to go play in Greece. Um, you mentioned Dave Anderson, Matt Nielsen, these guys were, mm. were pretty crucial in me making, Glenn Savile as well. He didn't really get the chance to go to Europe, but he was an influence in me making the decision to go over. Um, Johnny really was also my team. And I actually signed with, with his agent, Leon Rose, who's now the president of the Knicks, funny enough. And Leon was like, yeah, pushing me to make that decision. And, you know, I think I stuck over there pretty well because um, off the court, I tried to do what the locals did. I had a real good rep, uh, a relationship with people, you know, around the club, the, the, the local players, the fans, I'm kind of adjusted to them. I'm, I'm in your city now. I've got to kind of adjust your way of life in a way. And um, I think that's why I stuck everywhere I went and, um, yeah, enjoyed every minute of it. It's weird because we hear a lot of horror stories about Australians going over to play in Europe, not getting paid, not having a great time. You somehow forged like an entire life over there, right? Your daughter was born there. Um, can you talk us through the story? Of, I feel like it's a famed story now of the, the day she was born and oh, yeah. what followed. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't love to tell it, but I, I'll, my wife will kill me. But um, <laughs> she, she, uh, she thinks I dine out on a little bit too much. Uh, but basically, yeah, I was playing for Grand Canaria where I'd kind of reset my career a little bit playing there. Um, I was in a bit of a lull in between probably the Beijing and London Olympics. I was kind of to and fro where I was going to stick and... I always wanted to play in Spain. The ACB at the time was the best, probably the best domestic league outside the NBA. So I was lucky to, to get a contract there as an import and uh, just kind of found my place there. And um, you know, my, my first year, I re-signed for the next year early on, which doesn't happen often in Europe. And um, yeah, my, my daughter was, was born over there and you know, she was supposed to be born in November, but we had a Sunday afternoon game as you do uh, playing in the Spanish league because the soccer's at night and they don't want to clash. And um, Beth, was, she was born on a nine o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning. And I told the coach, oh, I'll probably, I'll probably won't be able to play today, mate. We got a game in three hours. My wife just had a baby. And we were playing against Mercia, who, who was kind of a mid-table team. Um, Barlow actually played for him for a couple of years. He wasn't playing in this game. And um, yeah, so Beth was born. There's a, some circumstances with her birth, which I won't go into, which were a bit difficult. But um, basically, my wife was just we we're watching the game from from our from our rooms, an old old school surgery hospital room, and it was one of the TV where the TV you had to put a coin in, <laughs> you had to put one euro into the TV to be able to watch the game. And uh, we we're watching the game there. I was playing with Ben Hansborough. He was the other import with me at the time. Uh, He'd gone down and done his knee, like probably five minutes in, and we were playing one of the local kids who, who's, that normally doesn't really happen. The local kids don't really get to play much, they're more that they help us out in training. And I was sitting there like, oh, well, we're, getting, we're down by about 25 now. And the phone starts buzzing, oh, how, how's Beth? You know, how's, how's Bridge? I'm like, oh, yeah, they're all right. <laughs> Could you come and play? <laughs> and the, the GM, and I said, oh. Ironically, the hospital was a, a five minute cab ride down the road. So I said, oh, Bridge was on the phone with mother. So she was probably not thinking in the right spot, thinking, oh, yeah, he'll just go play and come back. And I'm like, all right, I'll come. I'll go play. <laughs> so I've left my wife. She's just had a baby, <laughs> which probably wasn't the best thing to do. And I got to pay the guy 10 euros, get me there as quick as you can. He drops me out the front. 
and it was half time of the game and uh, everyone's outside. It's Bay run smoking cigarettes and they've seen me, oh, you're like, he's here, you know, <laughs> thinking that I, I'm thinking that I'm just going to come and sit on the bench. If someone fouls out and we're down, I, I, I might get in. And I had a very good relationship with Pedro Martinez, my coach. So I've gone in, they've started the second half. I'm getting taped in the old tunnel and done a couple of run, uh, stair runs just to have my legs ready in case. Just to warm up. Just to warm up a little bit, <laughs> thinking I might get in. And sitting there, a minute happens, someone fouled, and Pedro goes, you, in. And I've gone, all right, this is on. And I'm just running on pure adrenaline right now. I think yeah. my pregame meal was a Mars bar at 3 a.m. Uh, in the lead up to the birth. I slept at the hospital the night before. And uh, I've just checked in and we went on this massive run. I think it was like a 27-0 run or something. And we come back and we, we won the match. And, you know, I'm doing dunks, hanging on the rim, pointing at people. <laughs> and I was feeling myself, I'm not going to lie. And, uh, yeah, the crowd just got among, ar around it. And next thing you know, the, the, I'm back in the doctor's car and we're back to the hospital. I haven't showered. And I've just pulled up, still sweaty, and just went and played basketball for 20 minutes and had a win, you know. So... Yeah, one, one, a thing I'll never forget, and I guess the island appreciated what it, what it did and the club loved it, and, you know, my wife probably was the one who suffered the most through all that, and uh, she has to hear this story, I guess, every three or four years. But, yeah, what, what, what a time, and, you know, we're, we're lucky we're actually taking my family over uh, in, in April. So it's the club's 60th year, Grand Canaria, and um, they're celebrating by having some old players come back and... I've been invited over, so me and my family are going over, and Beth will see where she grew up. So it's pretty cool. So, and then tell me, was the family the the main part of the decision to return to the NBL when you joined the Sydney Kings in 2016? Uh, a little bit. Like I was, I think I just I was 31 maybe, and I was still playing really good basketball. Um, I had another year on my contract in in the Spanish league, but I, I was playing as an import, and I was always. So it's a little bit diff more difficult. You're easily replaceable as an import. And um, I had an offer to, from, from Sydney to come back and play for three years. The NBL was starting to do some really good things. Um, myself and Kev got good offers to come home and I could see some pretty cool things on the table down in Sydney. And I guess, yeah, I, I wanted to be able to still play good basketball, I guess, at the latter end of my career. And yeah, just the decision to come back to Australia was a bit of family, you know, coming back to Australia. And, you know, we had our son, he was born in Sydney. so. Uh, yeah, probably a little bit of family, a little bit of personal wanting to do well in front of family and friends again as well. So that was the first time that I really got to watch you in person. I was in Sydney at the time, so I got to watch all of your years there. Uh, and the thing that, the overarching theme of when I watched you and then I, when I watched you in the past was the thing I always think is downhill. That's the way you play, right? Head on the rim sort of stuff. Almost unstoppable when you sort of get ahead of steam. Did how did you develop like that part of your game, which I think ended up being like the signature part mm -hmm. of what you did? Yeah, I guess from an early on, I always had a pretty quick first step, and um, probably my first few years in the NBA, I was probably more of a like I, I was a slasher, but I, I probably shot a bit better than what I, I did as I progressed throughout my career. And I guess playing in Europe, no one really attacked the basket that hard, and I felt like. The rim protection wasn't as strong potentially as well you know so i thought oh, i have an advantage i can get past my man quite easy i'm gonna get to the hoop and i guess i just carried that throughout my career as, as my one of my main strengths and i guess a lot of people as they get older they it goes the other way around you become more of a shooter but i kind of i never really lost that step uh probably lost it now though <laughs> to be honest that's probably why i'm retiring but uh yeah i just always felt like, well, if I can get to the hoop, it's easier than shooting a three for me. I'd rather get there and finish around the basket. And I guess that's just the confidence I had. And it, I'd always, if I could get on the hoop early in a game, I'd, that would boost my confidence and make the rest of my game a lot easier. Uh, so we saw a lot of that uh, with the Boomers as well, uh, two Olympics, World Cup. Can I ask about the current Boomers, the way you see them now? And I think a lot of people maybe take for granted those who paved the way. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about, you know, 2008, 2012, up to now. And what was it like when you saw all of those boomers come into Hoop City that <laughs> day? Uh, you know, you see Giddy and Dyson and Jack White and Landale and all these guys come in and you sort of look and you think you were a part of the boomers yeah. who paved the way and this is what the boomers are now. Yes, it's an interesting question. Like, um, I guess our, our period 
probably myself, Barlow, uh, a few others sat. We we were in that like transition phase of when, like in the two thousand, like the year two thousand, they come forth. We miss out and oh, we didn't even go to a World Cup in 01, I don't think. 02, sorry. And then kind of this new group is thrown together for Athens and that kind of led through right through to till, till, till Rio, I guess, when we hit the top four again. Um, we were just kind of like thrown into it. Like you're playing for Australia, you know, and we didn't really have a whole lot of experience. And uh, I, I guess I, the way I look at it is we kind of helped, you know, the Ingalls, the Millses, Golding, these guys who now are mainstays of the last few campaigns, kind of helped them, Delhi as well, um, you know, have the confidence, I guess, to play on the, the international stage. And, you know, in Rio, they, all those guys were kind of two Olympics in. And, you know, being a part of all that, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm, a proud, I'm proud to be a part of all that and see where they've gotten to. But now, I guess the challenge is now we've got all these NBA stars, how do we keep the old school... Australian mentality as a team together and I think we've definitely got the veterans to do it and just it'll be a matter of the young guys picking up on it and 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 I think that they've definitely got the chance to go and do that guys like Whitey and Josh um Dante I'm a big fan of it he, he gets the hoop so he's my personal favorite <laughs> boomer at the moment but um yeah I, I think them guys have been around kind of the older generation they'll, they'll all learn how what it, what it means and what the things you need to do I guess um but like from what I hear, the camp it's different now. Camp like we used to take our own knives and forks and plates <laughs> and have catering come in and cook for us and these kind of things. Now guys just they got their own room and they kind of do their own thing and they meet at training. So, yep. uh, but I, I might be wrong. I don't know how it all is, but I definitely think yeah we have a chance to still be a powerhouse in the world. And you know maybe the World Cup was a bit of a blip, but you know we get a lot of our players back and I think we can definitely have a good push. I say we, I'm not playing, but I still feel. You know, I follow every game and I still feel like the, the team in Paris can get back up there. I think you can say we. The Boomers is like a family. I feel yeah, like you're yeah, forever part of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of the NBA, uh, it, it's become like a thing where every few years your draft rights get traded. <laughs> so you get drafted by the Rockets and then you get traded to the Lakers and most recently you got traded to the Knicks. Um, what? Who tells you? Does, does someone tell you this? <laughs> it had, uh, do you know? The first time around, oh, I think... I was playing, I went back, so I finished my first year in Sydney, went back and played in Ike for like six months, just a quick, you know, off-season thing. In Athens, thing. Right? In Athens yeah, yeah. yeah, back in Athens where my first year, and that was fun, took my family with me, and Tommy Garlop used to keep a pretty strong eye, my old teammate Tommy, uh, he'd keep a pretty strong eye on all things NBA. So I guess he would see, I don't know, Hootsite, what are the old websites that things used to come up on? Yeah. Twitter now, I spell X, what it is, and um, he, would have, he would have seen something through the night and whatever my rights, and he took me in the morning. He goes, "You're a Laker, man." I'm like, <laughs> like on WhatsApp, I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He goes, "Look at look at this." It's like, oh. So I hit my agent, uh, Mishko, at the time, and I'm like, oh, "Mishko, my rights just got traded to the Lakers. What does this mean?" He goes, "Ah, oh, this is nothing. Uh, you are playing here. Don't worry." I was like, "Oh, cool. Thanks for the support, man." And then the the next thing happened. It's quite similar. I think I just had a message from someone. It might have been might have been my Twitter. I just seen all these mentions and. Yeah, I was like, oh, hang on, what's going on here? And it ended up being a bit of a joke. Yeah, I guess the New York people had some fun with it and the NBL put me in a jersey. And Yeah, I mean, it was, it's funny and all that, but it's a little bit like, oh, what could have been? But, you know, I just said, I'll be happy to sit courtside at a Nick game. That'll, that'll do me. Um, now, over your domestic career, you've never won a title. Uh, now, you're part of the Melbourne United team that I think has a very good chance of doing that. Uh, how much would it mean to you to walk away from your career with a championship of some sort? Yeah, I mean, I won one as a junior uh, with, with the Emus, and I was like, oh, well, this will just happen every year, I suppose. When, when, I, when I kind of came into it, and with Townsville, we went straight to the semis. So I was always felt like I was very close at, at the young age. And then, of course, you move to Europe where, you know, there's payrolls and these kind of things are on a different level. And, yep. you know, your teams like Olympiacos, Penneth and Icos are just perennial, uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona. So if you can just compete with them, you've actually done quite well. and. I guess make like the teams that I played for always made playoffs. That was always the, the goal. We managed to get to a third place a few times with my, my Greek teams and playing in Turkey, the same thing. We played in the semis. And then uh, when I moved to uh, Grand Canaria, they hadn't even played in the playoffs. They were almost relegation when I got there. So we went on and we played in Barcelona in the semis who, who went on to win it. So um, I've, I've always competed for titles. Uh, it's not as if I've never been in playoffs and those kind of things. And the team went to a Copa del Rey final and a Euro Cup final, which was never been done before. And 
uh, that, that was my Spanish team. And yeah, come back to the NBL and Sydney, we kind of were expected to do well and things that we started well and didn't work out my first year. Second year, we had a lot of injuries. I think Kev missed most of the year. And the third year, we got the Vogueman. So we were like, oh, we're on here. And we made the semis. Uh, and then the following year, my fourth year was, that was the year I think we, we, when we had Will Weaver and Casper uh, Ware and everyone was healthy, kick it, uh, Bogues, Jay Sean Tate. That was a pretty good team. We Ironically, we, we get to game three of the grand final series and you know things all shut down. So that was probably the closest in my prime I got to, to getting to a championship. And, you know, you, you, you think back and go, what could have been? But, you know, I guess now here with Melbourne, I, that's why I came here to Melbourne was to get, get a ring. And um, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, Dino reached out to me after I finished up in Sydney. And that first year, we, we had a pretty good season. We ran the table pretty much for the whole year. And, uh, yeah, we just ran into a very hungry jack jumpers in their first uh, playoffs. And, they got us in game three, and um, you, I thought, honestly, that was me done then. I was worried that I'm never going to get another chance, and my career's probably finished, and you know, thankful to the club, they put me on for another year, and same thing happens, we, we miss out, and I go, am I done again? And finally, I get, I get another chance this year to go back to the finals. Uh, yeah, just to kind of cap everything off would be great to, to go out with a, with a ring, and the players we've got, you know, we bring in Ian Clark, who's got that experience, JLA's back, he's played in playoffs, won championships. Same with uh, Healthy Shaili, mm -hmm. delhi has been amongst it, Travers has been in, in championship series, and of course our captain Chris has played in multiple championship series. So I think we've got the horses to go and do it, and uh, I'll be doing what I can to make sure everybody's happy. So what's next? What, what does life after playing basketball look like for you? Well, I do like talking, as uh, probably taking up a lot of your time today. Uh, something in this space would be pretty cool uh, if that comes up. But um, it looks like United's going to put something on for me uh, in the hospitality kind of area, working with, with uh, in, the, in the development as well with, with young kids and also you know, some, some game night sponsorship stuff. So wining and dining, I guess you would call it. Uh, that's how it's looking at the moment. But, you know, there's still a bit to happen until then. But, you know, being around my kids more... Um, it's funny, like, I'm probably going to miss um, the whole, you know, as a professional basketballer, you do actually get to spend more time with your kids. Than, like, I get, to, I get to drop them at school, I get to pick them up every day. So you move into a nine to five, that kind of changes a little bit in that space. My son said to me, I told him the other day, I so said, I'm retiring, Charlie. Like, I, don't play, I won't play basketball for a living. And he said, well, that's all right. You just have to try a new sport. <laughs> I'm like Charlie. I'm 39, 38. Like that's that's not easy, mate. I don't know what you're thinking, uh, but you know. So being around my family, I'll start coaching him a little bit more, and my daughter, and you know, just that, those kind of things will, will happen as well. My, and my wife, Bridge, she's gone out and got her own job as well. So uh, we, we're prepared for life after basketball. Well, look, if we end up being colleagues, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, congratulations on a very, very impressive career, and for your sake, I hope you get to finish it with a title. Thanks, man. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Brad.